Buena. Hello, my name is Jose Fuster. I am a Cuban visual artist. For years now, I have been developing a community project in my neighborhood. The project has contributed to bringing about change in the community. I am pleased to be here with you to tell you the story. I am grateful for the invitation that the organizers extended to me, which allows me to visit this prestigious Rutgers University. I will be talking with you about my project and more generally about the topic the arts as a catalyst for community development and neighborhood transformation. Visual arts have always been a powerful tool for development and transformation. Thousands of years ago, rock art changed the environment and exerted a strong impact on people. Afterwards, one could always find artists interested in transforming their environment. It is true that in more recent centuries, visual artists are usually seen as being limited to their workshop and to galleries. But cases like that of Constantin Brancusi always existed. In Tirguju, his natal town, Brancusi built several monumental sculptures that forever changed the town. Yet I believe that it was particularly in the 1960s and 1970s that this tendency really exploded. In those years, various countries of the world were shaken by strong movements of the blacks, of women, of native citizens, etc., in many countries. At the same time, artists whose work outgrew their studios or workshops were also appearing everywhere. Their work literally spilled out into the streets. Many artists in different parts of the world followed this trend. It was the case of contemporary artist Isaiah Zagar with his project The Magic Garden in southern Philadelphia. Without coordinating my plans with anyone else, I also felt a comparable impulse. That is why my project could be included within the framework of the thrust that this general development brought about. My basic goal was to bring art nearer to my neighbors and to turn them into accomplices of a sort with respect to my art. From the idea to its implementation. Aymanitas is a fishing village that has been engulfed by Havana and is now a neighborhood of the extreme west of Cuba's capital. It was mostly populated by fishermen and other low-income workers. Their homes were modestly built, mostly board houses with child roofs. Few people visited Jaimanitas except to buy fish or to go swimming in its beaches. The idea of transforming my neighborhood occurred to me in the early 1970s. This was when I visited Romania in one of those exchanges of young artists with what were then Eastern European socialist countries. In Romania, I went to see the works that Brancusi had built in Tirguju and particularly its transforming effect on the human environment.
Nevertheless, I live in Cuba, which is a country of scant resources. Therefore, I knew that I myself would have to provide the necessary funds for my project. To understand the philosophy, the ethics and the aesthetics of Fuster and this project, we must place them in their locust and in their times. Fuster belongs to a very peculiar generation of Cubans, which is also mine. We were 11 or 12 year old kids when the revolution came to power and we wanted to imitate the bearded heroes who had just come down from the mountains. Thus, we immediately went to teach illiterate people to read and write and to perform productive tasks in the mountains. And there, we discovered a country we knew nothing about. The physical and human scenery of the countryside, and particularly the mountains, will later on appear repeatedly in Fuster's work. Shortly afterwards, we were able to study whatever we wanted for free. Interns in excellent schools. My school and dormitory were based in Havana's most exclusive neighborhood, in mansions abandoned by the bourgeoisie that fled to the United States. The school for art trainers where Fuster studied was located in what had been and would later on be again the exclusive Hotel Comodoro. Later on, as workers, we had all our basic needs covered without luxuries but also without poverty. That is why it never occurred to us to accumulate money for ourselves, but for works that would benefit the entire community. At the time, I was working at a workshop of artistic ceramics, and I was known basically as a ceramist. Although I had won certain awards and prizes with my ceramics, it was not ceramics that could provide me the necessary financial resources. Thus, in my spare time, I began to make oil paintings on canvases, which were more highly valued in the art market. Little by little, I affirmed my renown as a painter and began to accumulate the essential funds for the project. Thanks to the sale of my art, by the early 1990s, I could count on sufficient funds. In 1992, I was able to begin my long-cherished building work to initiate the project. If you do the math, you will see that between the conception of the idea and the beginning of its implementation, 20 years had elapsed. Other artists are luckier and can count on waiting less time to secure financial resources for their projects. But those 20 years allowed me to polish and improve the idea of the project, turning it around in my mind. Financing the project. I already explained that I always knew that I would have to finance my project myself. I also decided from the start that my art would only be sold in my studio workshop which was to be located at the very center of the construction project. Against the advice of many, I also determined very early that we would not charge any entrance fee. I thought that, as little as we might charge, there would always be people who would not be able to pay. But that principle forced us to renounce to what would be a good sum of money, because there are days in which up to a thousand visitors come to my studio workshop. In order to allow everyone to buy my art, I also offer more simple works of smaller format, although the income from their sale is much smaller. Afterwards, we also began to sell books about my art, calendars, postcards, bags, and t-shirts, etc. However, 
the revenue from all of those items is relatively limited. In response to the insistent request of friendly institutions, sometimes we offer simple meals for special groups of visitors. Again, the income from this undertaking is small and the workload is considerable, but it satisfies our friends and provides some employment. In recent months, we built a sculpture money box so that visitors who might wish to leave a contribution might do so. But, I repeat, the major source of sustenance for this quite expensive project continues to be the sale of the more costly oil paintings. I will tell you something that most certainly you ignore. Sometimes visitors ask me how much the project has already cost. I reply that it has cost three times more than it would have cost in any other country of the world. Cuba endures many economic difficulties. Some are our own fault, but most of them have to do with the U.S. embargo. In the 1960s and 1970s, I was forced to ask my friends not to throw away any small piece of copper or any used battery. In those decades, pigments and even tiles were practically inexistent in Cuba. Nowadays, we do have on the market but, for instance, it has been months that white tiles are nowhere to be found. Our market is poorly supplied and unstable. This week we might find toilet paper. Perhaps next week we will not. The same happens with canvases, paint, brushes, tiles, cement, etc. To obtain most of the tiles I need, as well as other articles, I have to locate them in Dominican Republic or Panama. Then, the logic step would be to order them by computer on the net. But again, the embargo prevents us Cubans from doing it. No bank on earth would dare do the transaction for fear of being fined by the U.S. Treasury Department. So I have to buy a plane ticket and travel abroad at least once a month to obtain what I cannot find on the Cuban market and I cannot order. Something valued in less than $100 ends up costing $800 because of the plane ticket and the excess luggage. This absurd price increase is a very peculiar problem that my project faces, and it does not affect any other artists from any other country. If this limitation had not existed, my project would have achieved twice or three times more than it has been able to do. The dynamics between the community and the project. 1992, the year we began the project, was difficult indeed for the Cuban economy. People were undergoing many terrible hardships. That is the reason why I hesitated, wondering whether I should start off the project or channel the funds instead to finance other pressing social needs. But then I thought that art and beauty were very important in those times of dire material needs. Indeed, since its very inception, the project strongly caught the attention of neighbors. I have been living in Jaimanitas 25 years. 
Coincidentally, I moved here when Fuster's project, The Joy of Living, began. A lovely project. We can speak of Jaimanitas before and after the project. Before, Jaimanitas was a plain, common town as any other. Not many people knew this neighborhood. Around my house, things looked ugly. Ugly fencing wires and a lot of uncultivated vegetation. It was a gloomy Jaimanitas. But as the project prospered, the town flourished. It was beautified. As soon as you get here, you experience a spiritual peace of a sort. If you feel stressed when you return home, you just have to glance at the murals and facades and you feel relaxed spiritually. Because it is beautiful. We are full of all types of art. You can find a rooster crowing or a palm tree or a tribute to some institution or to historic personalities. The first thing I built was the monumental front wall of my property, and I did it practically alone. Then my neighbors began to ask me if I would build or decorate their walls, their facades, or their roofs. This gave way to a dynamics that encompassed all of my neighbors. Neighbors say that before, Jaimanitas was a simple fisherman's village, but thanks to this project, it has become alive. In the history of Fusterland, there are moments that have the aspect of legends or fables. That was the case when we remember how the construction works began. When Fuster was building his front wall, a neighbor from around the corner went by repeatedly, staring at the wall, and then she said, Fuster, you're so lucky to have enough money to build that lovely wall. All my life I wanted to have a big pretty wall like that in front of my house with an archway saying Villa Iris. Her name was Iris, of course. But I've never had enough money, although I'm a nurse, I've healed people throughout Cuba, I've saved lives in Angola and elsewhere, but I have no money to build that. So Fusto replied, don't worry, I'll build it for you. When he was building Iris's wall, Another neighbor, this one from across the street from Fuster's place, went by and one day said to him, Yeah, sure, you're building her wall because she's a good worker. You wouldn't do it for me because what am I? A simple housewife. What do I do? Just raise kids. You wouldn't build such a wall for me. But Fuster replied, Don't worry, I'll build your wall. Then, while he was building this second wall, a third neighbor, a middle-aged woman from further down the street, came and spat at him. Of course, you build the walls for both of them because they're young and pretty. You wouldn't do it for an old hag like me, would you? So Fuster answered back, certainly, I'll build it for you. And that's how Fuster began building the neighborhood walls. The great majority of my neighbors like my art. Nevertheless, there are a few who do not like it. That is why some of them continue to build and decorate in a traditional way. On the other hand, I soon understood that I could no longer pursue my project alone, without assistance. I gradually began to create a brigade of bricklayers, young men from the neighborhood, who receive a salary that I pay for their work. 
Some of my neighbors decided to profit from the crowd of visitors to the project and opened their shops or provided spaces to be leased for the sale of all sorts of crafts. I discovered this community that had already been enlivened by Fuster's works. Lovely, attractive, colorful, charming, very special, and I realized no one was selling the types of crafts generally sold to foreigners. I thought perhaps it was not allowed, so I had a conversation with Fuster to ask him, after many days thinking what I would tell him, because I was hesitant. I seemed to be wanting to invade his space. And he replied, no, I have no inconvenience whatsoever, you can sell your own works, your crafts here. I talked to neighbors who allowed me to use their garage without any pay, because we were friends and I was able to sell my crafts. That is how I started and I was the first shop vendor who sold crafts here five years ago. And we were very grateful, me and my whole family, whose members I incorporated to work here with me. My wife, my daughter, my son-in-law, we all work here. We are a large family of 12 members working here. Diverse young artists and some apprentices of art dealers also rented nearby spaces to open galleries in which to exhibit and sell their artworks. Thus, the project provides direct and indirect income for a considerable amount of neighbors. However, beyond all those economic benefits, Jaimanitas has also made some progress in a social sense. We, the neighbors of this community, are quite proud to live in such a place, a community of art, a place that instills life into us, so we cooperate in keeping the place clean. Neighbors are now privileged in a way because they can interact with visitors coming from anywhere in the world. Sometimes visitors are celebrities that neighbors had heard of but never dreamed of meeting in person. It seems as if the project not only put Jaimanitas back on the map, but placed this town somewhere near the very center of the globe. Thanks to Fuster's project, many personalities have come by, and I have had the enormous pleasure of personally meeting, for instance, Madonna, Katy Perry, John Bon Jovi. I've been able to take photos with them, people who I never had any hope of meeting in my life. The initiatives undertaken to beautify the town, the continuous flow of visitors, and the social activities organized by the project have contributed to changing both Jaimanitas and its inhabitants. And the inhabitants, Jaimanitans themselves, have contributed to changing the project in various directions. This is a dynamics that continues on to this very day. Fuster has always been very acquiescent with respect to whatever his neighbors wanted on their walls, their roofs, their facades, uh, particular personal family things. A neighbor who had seen the walls he had built said, you cannot build a wall for me because my field has nothing to do with your art. I am a Japanese language teacher. So Fuster built her a wall with a phrase in Japanese. Another neighbor said, I don't like roosters. I am a pacifist and I love doves. But you don't make doves, do you? Of course, Fuster did a dove for him and also an anti-war mural on his wall. 
vivía también un, una muchacha que se llamaba Nearby Diana. lived a young girl Su named Diana. Her ella, parents ella loved her dearly, mi hija, and her mother told Fuster that she considered her daughter as lovely as a princess, as Princess Diana. So Fuster wrote on the archway, Princess Diana. Still another neighbor said he wanted to honor his lovely wife. His wife's name was Maria. So Fuster wrote Maria Bonita, Pretty Mary, on the archway. And so he went on complying to his neighbor's wishes. One neighbor who was a jiu-jitsu trainer asked him to put the yin and the yang somewhere, so Fuster put it on his roof. Coming to terms with bureaucracy. In every country of the world, there is always a conflict going on between creativity and bureaucracy. Both of them are necessary. Without creativity, there would be no progress. But without bureaucracy, it would be chaos. I believe that, in every case, the outcome of this clash between creativity and bureaucracy determines the course of progress. The visual artist and friend of mine, Isaiah Zagar, who began his project in Philadelphia in the 1970s, provides a good example of this. In those days, he was repeatedly thrown in jail because of the strict anti-graffiti laws of the times. But nowadays, Zagar and his project are recognized and they can do most anything they wish in southern Philadelphia. In 1992, when I began my construction work, a project such as mine required the authorization of several different institutions. One of them was in charge of verifying the property rights of the premises. Another one checked the architectural solidity of the project and its compliance with construction standards and rules. Yet another one valued the aesthetical angle and the integration of the new construction to the other buildings of the neighborhood. At least one more had to do with the project's demand of electricity or other services, etc. I thought that getting so many institutions to agree on one same project would add again more time to the 20 years that I had already lost since I had first conceived the idea of my project. That is the reason why I proceeded to start building the walls without taking steps to procure permits or licenses. As time went by, inspectors from the various institutions began to visit my project and to warn me of the fact that my construction works were illegal. They impressed on me the threat that they would demolish my work if I did not demolish it myself. Nevertheless, in its struggle, bureaucracy usually suffers a major handicap, its slowness. By the time that a truck full of men with big hammers arrived to knock down my front wall, I had already built or decorated several front walls and facades of my neighbors. Therefore, what ensued was a noisy discussion, almost a riot, between the bureaucrats and the locals, who fought dearly to preserve their walls from being demolished. At the end, the bureaucrats yielded. They would not demolish what was already built, but I would be forced to pay a fine. And so the project went on. We continued to build and almost always to pay fines until the present day. When I was asked to embellish the local surgery, what we call the family doctor's house, I immediately proceeded to do it. Nevertheless, Shortly after having concluded the work, a brigade of workers came and removed all my art, including all the tiles. Some bureaucrats had sentenced that all the family doctor houses must have a uniform aspect. Of course, later on, other officials denied this and presented their formal excuses for the destruction of my art. They asked me to decorate the building again, and I did it for a second time.
There have been other cases in which orders have been issued to stop the works on the construction of my project due to the lack of an official signature on a document, etc. The relationship between a project of this kind and bureaucracy can be a very conflicting issue, and the artist must very carefully measure his actions. Tracing the limits of the scope of the project. When a person undertakes a project such as mine, from the very beginning he or she must trace the borders of all the actions to be encompassed by the project. Of course, later on, the interaction established with the community and with particular institutions might move in various directions the borders of the original project. My project initially concentrated on building artistic walls for my neighbors. But as time went by, it began to encompass more and more activities. For instance, the owner of a two-story house across the street from my studio workshop requested initially for me to build his front wall. Afterwards, the owner asked me to decorate his facade. Finally, he asked me to build a new roof on a portion of his upper story. Time went by and the family no longer fitted comfortably within the space of the house. They began to build a third story with their own resources. But that third story would be an important focal point of my project, so I decided to undertake the whole responsibility of its construction myself. Later on, there were initiatives to build or decorate not only homes, but also some more social premises and areas. The first of them was the already mentioned House of the Family Doctor. Another one was the Home for Expectant Mothers. Later on, I decorated the interior of the local polyclinic. I also renewed an almost abandoned local park with a sculpture of a unicorn and new benches. A cyclone destroyed the home of a local family and I offered to rebuild the roof. The people of Jaimanitas constantly complained of being forced to wait for the bus under the sun or the rain. In their periodical meetings with their municipal assembly representatives, they repeatedly asked for the state to provide them with bus shelters. But there was little money available and the state had priorities of investing on renewing the polyclinic or building new school rooms, etc. So one day they decided to ask me to build them and I did. I also had the idea of building signs for the mostly anonymous streets of Jaimanitas and I proceeded to materialize it. But we never wanted to limit the contributions of the project to construction activities. I graduated from the Visual Arts Academy San Alejandro, and as all the pre-graduates in Cuba, I had to do two years of what we call social service, which I did at the Fuster Studio Workshop. I have been here these past two years, and it has been for me another school of a sort, because I have learned a lot of things. I have had the field of art more open for this reason. Very early, the project carried out pottery and ceramic courses for children. Oh. 
Occasionally, we also organize recreational or commemorative activities mostly aimed at local children and youths. We also attributed a great importance to sporting activities. We even brought great masters of world chess to play with the local people. Children were motivated to stage a performance in which they would reproduce a famous game in the history of world chess. More recently, we built spaces to play children's game of bygone days, or to paint with colored chalks a wall prepared as a blackboard, or to play basketball. But the truth is that, lately, the lack of spare time and appropriate sites has dampened our wishes. Nevertheless, we have pursued activities of cultural training for our neighbors. The inauguration of a particular mural of cultural, social or historical content becomes a perfect opportunity to train them. And together with other local institutions, we periodically convene children and youths to cooperate in tasks of ecological protection. But to be honest, the truth is that we must find a way to undertake many more activities of a social nature with the local community. Confronting problems in the dynamics between the project and the community. In a project such as mine, many problems arise. And in the first place, the problems related to the constant influx of foreign tourists. Certain neighbors complain of the noise made by the tourist buses or of the streets being full of vehicles and visitors. Yes, certain neighbors complain of the back and forth of tourist buses and cars, but that is the price you pay for being a landmark. Furthermore, the possibility of gaining economic profit awakens contradictions. For instance, a neighbor of mine told me he would allow me to build a decorated front wall for his house, but only if I gratified him with 500 pesos. Of course, I refused, and up to this day his front wall continues to contrast with those of his neighbors. But that same neighbor, soon enough, began to profit from the project by opening a shop for selling articles to the tourists. Nowadays, you can find many shops in the immediate vicinity of the studio workshop hoping to capture the attention and the purses of the tourists. Therefore, competition among those shops sometimes becomes very confrontational. I cannot deny that when competition started, it bothered me because I had been comfortable being alone as the only shop vendor. It was much better. But the spirit of improving my work, the pride I felt for having been the first, and I hope the best, has allowed me to prosper. These small shops enter into contradiction one against the other and also against the very studio workshop. The shop owners go as far as to bribe tourist bus drivers or guides to make sure that tourists went to their shops before visiting the studio workshop. But you must bear in mind the fact that all the money that these shops collect go entirely to the owner's personal profit. I have not succeeded in my hope that they might at least minimally and voluntarily contribute funds to the project from which they profit. The owner of a new neighborhood restaurant whose front wall and facade I had built and decorated told me that he wished to insert himself into the project. What he actually wanted was for the studio workshop to send him clients, but without contributing anything to the project in return. Wherever people see the possibility of easy money, all types of illegal behaviors are bound to appear. 
Some local children who have no real economic needs can be seen from time to time skipping school to beg for money or articles from tourists. Problems like prostitution and the illicit sale of goods are also likely to appear. Certain shops go as far as offering cheap imitations of my art. Summing up, a negative quest for profit is unleashed without producing any parallel impulse to financially contribute to the project. Those are trends that we must at least try to keep under control, even if it is a difficult task. Assuring the survival of the project. For a project of this type to survive, it is not enough to achieve the capture of the attention and the interest of neighbors. Beyond the neighborhood, what is needed is the emergence of friends of the project who believe in the project and contribute to spreading information and knowledge about it. I was lucky enough to be able to count on friends who believed in my project, encouraged me, and disseminated information about it since its very inception. Among them, I will only mention the Americans, Sandra Levinson, Michelle Frank, and Gail Reed, but there are many more. The media have also a very important role. Very early, I was able to count as friends several journalists who extensively reported my project and my activities on the written press, radio and television. Nowadays, articles and opinions also appear in the social media on the net. A very constant flow of communication is also required with institutions dealing with art or other related spheres. Prizes and awards received contribute not only to encourage, but also provide the basis for the perpetuation of the project. Quite recently, the Society of Folk Art of America handed me a plaque that declares Fusterland a monument of folk art that deserves protection and preservation. When a prestigious institution declares a project as deserving preservation, the road is open for local political authorities, in turn, to legislate about its preservation. On the other hand, a project such as this one also requires a permanent effort in the field of maintenance. The Caribbean is the saltiest of all open seas on Earth, and that is why our environment corrodes and deteriorates buildings very fast. Occasional accidents are also bound to occur. A car jumps on the sidewalk. The branch of a tree falls on a mural or a sculpture. Or terribly bad weather rages, such as recent Hurricane Irma, whose waves demolished a wall over 30 meters long decorated by my project.
Immediately, with a great effort and scant materials, we began to raise a new wall. We are incorporating fragments of the wall that was destroyed as a memory of Hurricane Irma and to pay tribute to the tremendous national effort of reconstruction. Today, I have members of my building brigade dedicated full-time to the job of maintenance. As time goes by, this effort will become more and more necessary and complicated. But we might wonder, will this project still be standing some 50 or 75 years from now? What will it look like? How will it function? For the time being, the management of the project has been in the hands of relatives, a family affair, together with my sons and grandsons. My elder son is my manager and representative, and with the excellent work he carries out, he makes it possible for me to dedicate myself more to my art. Perhaps at some point in time, relatives will function as a foundation of a sort or a board of trustees in charge of essentially preserving the project. That sentiment of love for this town is important in the new generation growing up now so that in the future they will preserve this beautiful work that has been done. So when Fuster is no longer with us, he will continue anyway to be with us. He will always be here because in every work that we admire, he will be present. But uh, what about the continuation of the project, the extension of constructions, etc.? Will decorated walls continue to multiply throughout Jaimanitas? Well, that would depend on the appearance of an artist whose works and philosophy would be compatible with mine in order to pursue the extension of the project. But that is a question for the future to answer, and life itself tends to go arranging things in its own inevitable way. Projects for the immediate future. For the immediate future, I have several projects already on course or turning around in my head. The workers of the local pharmacy asked me to embellish the facade of their building. We are now considering several alternatives. I also have a project to make some improvements in the Park of the Unicorn for kids to enjoy. Several years ago, as I said, I decorated the expectant women's home. Now that building will be turned into a senior citizen's home and I have been asked to change portions of the decoration. That is a problem that occasionally arises when a given building is expected to change its role. I also have an ongoing project which is by far more complex and for which I bought an old nearby house. I began the works to erect in its place a building that would serve a variety of purposes. One of them would be to at least be able to count on a hall in which we might stage courses, conferences, meetings, etc.
For several months, the works were brought to a halt by bureaucrats that demanded a long series of requisites. But the most ambitious project being implemented is the one related to an enormous parking lot located very near the studio workshop. This parking lot used to belong to a former club of the Cuban bourgeoisie that was early in the revolution transformed into a social club for workers. The enormous parking lot of the club has ceased to have any function nowadays because there are not so many automobiles in Cuba. After holding negotiations with the management of the club, I agreed to cooperate in the reconstruction of the wall that surrounds the parking lot and that is what I have been doing. On the outer part of the wall, I have been placing murals that are tributes to the various Latin American countries. This portion is being prepared for a mural that would be a tribute to Brazil. As soon as the perimeter wall is rebuilt, the idea is then to cover the whole area of the parking lot with asphalt or cement and then to build a stage inside. This would allow us to bring over orchestras three nights a week so that neighbors can dance or to hold other cultural activities. But again, we have confronted a series of difficulties that have slowed down and almost paralyzed these works. Those are, in short, the projects that we have in the making or at least turning around in our mind, as well as the difficulties that they are confronting. A few conclusions. In spite of those difficulties, I consider myself very fortunate for having been able to materialize my dream. If you ask me what would be the necessary factors to undertake a project such as the one that I am carrying out, I would answer as follows. First of all, you need to have a certain dose of talent. But not only artistic talent recognized by contemporaries, but also a certain dose of entrepreneurial talent. You must have a lot of imagination, and this imagination has to capture your neighbors, the media, art and other institutions, etc. You would have to convince a lot of people that what seems impossible might be difficult, but it is feasible. It is necessary for what some people see as your insanity to infect a lot of people, particularly those that work in the project. When I design a particular structure, a peculiar dynamics is unleashed among my workers. Most of the brigade members argue that it is impossible to build. However, in the end, those that believe it possible convince the others. Of course, a project like this one has a huge and constant demand of funds. If you cannot count on some generous patron, you have to be very generous yourself and be able to put your own money into the project. Unfortunately, you will not find many people ready to do that nowadays. Therefore, you must be very persistent in your behavior, running counter to the norm. Y 
Fuster's work continues on. Sometimes he faces problems to pursue a work, there are obstacles, uh, sometimes materials are scarce, but he is a true fighter, very perseverant, honoring the motto of the project, the joy of living. He is always endowed with an impulse for living and making things. He therefore continues on and every day comes up with something new. He says, let's do this here, some place for kids to play or for people of all ages to enjoy and let's do that there, etc. Con la burocracia. With bureaucracy and certain institutions, you must learn to walk a difficult tightrope. Furthermore, you must always bear in mind the fact that your project is essentially a collective work and that it is possible thanks to the cooperation of many people. The brigade of bricklayers has to be aware of the fact that the project materializes thanks to their work. Neighbors, and particularly children, must also think themselves as a part of the project so that they would protect it at all times. I think this project has been spectacular. It has virtually opened the doors for the people of Jaimanitas. We are all now more knowledgeable about art. The project has also helped many people economically as well as socially and culturally. I think it has been fantastic. Nevertheless, it is of utmost importance to uphold and develop an ethics of unselfishness as a central purpose. The spirit of generosity and altruism should be maintained at the highest level of the project and gradually capture as many neighbors as possible. Well, I believe that I have already talked too much. I thank you kindly for the attention you have given my presentation. I am now open to your comments and your questions. Thank you again.